the leader of the Communist Army for making much fun of Bidenomics anymore. They're thinking maybe it works to build from the middle out and the bottom up. It is clear that uh, President Biden's economic plan is working to grow the middle class, uh, spur investments in manufacturing. Turning to Bidenomics, we start from a position of strength. The U.S. economy is in solid shape. Bidenomics, which is the word of the day, word of the week, word of the month, word of the year here at the White House. So Bidenomics is not a word that the White House uses anymore. Last year's summer, they spent $40 million because they thought the numbers were strong. And on the surface, you look at unemployment, you look at GDP, um, you look at growth, and you say, okay, stock market looks good, let's do it. And it's not working. Where other times people say, you know, they, they feel a bit better about the country, even though the numbers aren't as strong as these apparently look. The one thing we don't look at is the debt, and we're paying more in the debt service with the interest rate these high than we are for the entire Defense Department. And we're only uh, raising defense maybe 1% or 2%, which is relatively scary and leaves us way too vulnerable. But that President Biden, if he's going to close the gap, it's not going to be with the economy. He is, uh, according to the recent polls, is uh, treading water without the American people and grading way below Donald Trump and who is better on the economy. So uh, joining us now is Julian Epstein. He serves as chief counsel for the House Judiciary Committee and staff director for the House Oversight Committee uh, for the Democratic Party, 96 to 2001. Julian, welcome back. Brian, thanks for having me. Good to be back with you. Hey, uh, Julian, a couple of things. I, I love the column you wrote about what's going on at the border because you take on what Texas did with SB4. Now, we know and we watched almost a week ago today. Uh, it was yeah, uh, yeah, a week ago today, we watched the National Guard being overwhelmed by illegal immigrants who just ran over them in an effort to get across, get into our country and get to the next fence. And all of them were let in. Nine have been charged with assault. But this is all part of the chaos of SB4, where Texas can arrest you if you come here illegally. And the only way to get out of jail is to leave the country. And SB4 has been held up in the court system. Where do you stand? Well, yeah, we have that overrunning of the border agents. And, you know, today New York is starting a program to give um, uh, uh, illegal migrants uh, uh, credit cards, um, yeah. debit cards. Um so the system, I mean, you could take any one of, you know, 20 clips that we've seen in the last month and conclude from that that the system is completely out of control. And we have, uh, you know, we have beyond chaos. We have a catastrophe here. This is a catastrophe that is completely um, of the making of the Biden administration. Biden has the ability to close the border. Under Section 1182, it's been validated by the Supreme Court. We've seen somewhere between 8 and 10 million illegal crossings under his presidency. The system doesn't have the capacity to handle it when you consider just the, un, the, the inability of 8 to 10 unassimilated, 8 to 10 million unassimilated migrants being able to integrate into the system in any meaningful way. Uh, look at what's happening in Europe. It's been a disaster in Europe. There's footage today in Paris of migrants storming law enforcement because they're deporting uh, illegal migrants there. I mean, it, this is this is chaotic throughout the entire West. It's something that Biden could fix immediately with a stroke of a pen. And uh, for political reasons, I think they refuse to. They are cowering to the uh, far progressive intersectional left who believes that uh, in a d demented, illogic, uh, de believes that enforcing immigration laws is, is racist. And this is just, this is where, you know, the left has really gone off the deep end. Um, in the Fifth Circuit case, Brian, you and I spoke about this a couple months ago. Uh, what the Fifth Circuit did yesterday was to extend the stay of the lower court so that SB4, uh, which allows Texas to enforce the law on its own, is put on hold, at least mm -hmm. until the case is tried on its merits. My guess is this will make it to the Supreme Court. There are really two issues that the Supreme Court will cover, uh, will address. One is whether uh, Texas' argument that this is invasion, an invasion, whether that's valid, and if it is an invasion under the Constitution, uh, Article 1, Section 10, I think it is, um, uh, the Texas has the right to uh, fend off an invasion. So that's the first issue. Uh, I'm not sure that Texas will win on that. I'm skeptical that Texas will win on that, on that issue. But there is a second issue that is um, that I think Texas has a better chance of prevailing on, which is 
In the 2012 case, the Arizona case, which you and I also covered, I think, in our last conversation, um, uh, Justice Scalia wrote the dissent. It, that was a case in which Arizona sought to enforce immigration laws uh, and work permitting through its own local authorities. And the Supreme Court struck down that Arizona statute, saying that enforcement of federal immigration laws was the provenance of uh, the federal government. Um, Scalia had a very important dissent in that opinion, where he said, so long as the state isn't changing the federal law, but merely supplementing the enforcement of it, um, then uh, that doesn't offend the Constitution. And so the question there, I think, is whether Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and, yeah. uh, and Comey will agree with that. And I think that's an open issue at the, at the, at, uh, when it but, gets to the Supreme Court. But, but Julian, so I love that, you know, I, have, I, don't, I love when you write in a way in which I can understand the law and the approaches and the strategy, but you, part, you talk about what Scalia said in the dissent. He said, look, if their policies back up federal policy, what's the problem? And, right. and in this case, it is doing what the federal government should be doing, and that's enforcing the laws that are on the books. And they're so frustrated after 8 million people come in, and they're saying, I've had it. So it's your problem that these policies don't line up, because Texas lines up with how the law is written. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I agree that this is a disaster, and this and something has to be done. I mean, this is, this is a complete this is a perfect example of elite disconnect, uh, that elites think that, uh, you know, elites in Washington think that eight or 10 million migrants isn't any big deal. We're, you know, give me your tired, your poor, your hurdled masses kind of a thing. Um, this sort of really idealized version of, of immigration in, in a world in which they don't have to live. You notice when migrants are sent up to Martha's Vineyard or into New York, that's when the liberals start to freak out. So what, um, you know, I think Scalia's argument has some possibility of succeeding. More importantly, this is not just a disaster for the country. This is a disaster for Biden politically. Seventy to 80 percent of his voters don't approve. Seventy eight percent of voters think that Biden has done an abysmal job on immigration and want to see the laws enforced. If you look at Black and brown working class voters, they are abandoning the party in droves. They know immigration is driving down their wages. Um, so uh, what what I think, what I propose in the article in the New York Post piece, uh, Brian, is that the administration ought to be sitting down with Governor Abbott. Yeah, of course. And ought to be saying, yes, we recognize he's this not. is a problem. This it's is not. a problem that the border, this is a problem that border states are bearing almost entirely. And this is just you know, unbelievable. Do as I say, not but, as I but do. But Julian, I have to amend what you said. This is the first time they're not uh, doing it all uh, themselves. They're being bused to these cities, so it's now a nationwide problem, and they st- it, they can't ignore it, but they want to blame it. I do want to get your take on the move right now to push Fonnie Willis off this case. The judge is li- the judge is listening to that argument. Well, who do you think will prevail here, judging by the judge's decision last time? to say Nathan Wade had to go? Well, I think if Fonnie Willis had any real interest in this case, she would uh, resign or accuse herself from it. Uh, This is an utter embarrassment. Um, I mean, this looks to me, uh, in my opinion, this was a kickback scheme uh, where she hired a boyfriend who was then providing her all kinds of benefits. Um, I think the whole claim about uh, the reimbursements um, is, is, is hard to believe. I think the claims about when the relationship began, I think those are very hard to believe. I think the judge was right to allow the Trump team to appeal. Uh, and uh, I think there's not just the question about whether she should be kicked off the case. I think there's a question potentially about perjury um, uh, moving forward that the state could take up, the legislature is going to look into. So I think there is, I mean, just... The, you know, the standard in Georgia is the is a conflict or the appearance of a conflict. And given that the there is a strong appearance that Fannie Lewis had an economic incentive for the case to move forward. I, mean, I don't know how you argue this is not an appearance of a conflict. Julian, uh, in any yeah. case, this is an utter embarrassment uh, for the, you know, amongst many other embarrassments for 
the, the, the lawfare crowd that is, you know, first prosecuting Trump in the 11th hour of this campaign. Julian Epstein, thanks so much for being fair and balanced. Appreciate it. Julian Epstein, Ryan, thank thanks you. Thanks for having me again. You got okay, it. So bye. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.